On this episode, NBA star Mason Plumley stops by. Nerd Chuck and this is episode 251 of the Ask Gary V Show. Pretty excited about this because I'm a huge NBA fan and we have a real life NBA player here with us. Mason Plumley is here. I'm gonna give him a second to uh, tell everybody uh, about himself but you are so are noticing. No phone today. We've decided to go old school on the Ask Gary V Show. I put out a tweet. We got some questions. Andy K, it's your chance to finally be India. I'm happy for you. This is something you've wanted for three or four years. I've seen the notes back and forth. You know, DRock showed me a text a couple years ago and said something like, what the fuck, why does Indy always get to do this? So this is a big moment for you as well, my friend. I'm happy for you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Mason, why don't you tell uh, the Vayner Nation uh, a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, You know, so obviously I play basketball. Um, From Indiana originally, went to high school and college in North Carolina. Uh, Spent my first two years with the Brooklyn Nets, two years, year and a half with the Portland Trailblazers, and then I was traded to Denver um, February um, this season. So... Uh, you know, I'm going into restricted free agency um, this off season, so I'm looking forward to that. And um, you know, basketball is my passion. It's what I do. It's what I. Um, it gets it, it gets me out of bed in the morning. I don't have to uh, think about it. I just love it, and um, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So that's that's my story, and that's how I'm here. It's a couple things. Tell me about. Um, so first of all, having being able to do what you love is like the greatest, course, right? Yeah. What outside of the basketball, like when we start going into the Mason sphere of interest that's out of that? Yeah. Entrepreneurship, sci-fi, food, like talk, yeah. give me some context here yeah. uh, and the viewers at home. Two things that I've really been drawn to, um, one being real estate. I've enjoyed uh, different real estate projects that I've done with partners. Um, did a couple here in Jersey when I lived in Jersey and then um, some in Washington State when I lived in Oregon. But um, so real estate has been um, very interesting to me. Um, you have like an re- awesome business model figured out, right? I play in a new market, buy up, right? Yeah, so. You like want to get traded and do stuff in free agency just to yeah. build your real estate empire. No, I, honestly, I was, you always want to be the player like Kobe that's one, one well, franchise, your whole, yeah. but if it doesn't happen, why not take advantage of it? Pretty cool. So real estate has been interesting to you? Real estate's been And fruitful, right? I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about your career and how long you've been in the league. The real estate market has been really strong during those years. Yeah, for sure. And, and the thought. And so what you buy things and rent out? Um, I've done rehab projects, I've done, uh, I've invested in other people's projects but then also um, just starting to, to explore development with a, a partner that I have so um, to me it's I've always wanted to take advantage of like I have a, a window where I know I have contracts and money coming in but NBA you can't play for until you're 60 you can't play till, till you're, um, you're you know confident. right so uh, there's a, a finite time to a career and I want to take advantage of the earnings that I have during this time and, and put aside some assets for when I retire. And not just earnings, right? Like, I mean, here we are sitting, obviously we got connected through you know, the inner weavings of our organization, but you're obviously thinking about, you know, look, 40 million people email this place, like I wanna be on the show. Obviously right. not only the dollars and what you can deploy, but having the platform of the NBA itself sure. that gives you opportunities. How are you thinking about the leverage of just the awareness and a brand or people willing to say yes to things while you're in the league? I think one of the things that I always tell players I started a sports agency. We're starting to rep players. My brother AJ is running it. We're actually today's a big day. We may have one of our first players ever get drafted. I tell them, look, I, t- I remember this vividly. I told a kid right to his face. I go, look, the only reason I'm sitting with you is because you're a New York Jet, right. and the Jets are my like heart and soul. I'm like, if you're a Bronco tomorrow, I'm gonna lose your number. And I right. and I actually meant it, not like to razz him, because I was telling him he was acting like a dope and he wasn't taking advantage of all the things he could be taking advantage of. Right. Um, you also, you know, it's funny you said North Carolina, I played, you know, when you, you went to Duke, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's one of the most popular co- like colleges yeah. in the world. Like there's just hundreds and thousands of people that are ruling the world that are willing to meet with you because you went to that university. Yeah. The access is insane. Yeah, and, and I had great veterans when I came in as a rookie in the league and uh, Kevin Garnett told me he's like, look, you can. He's like, you can pretty much sit down or meet whoever you want to. He said you just have to take the initiative to reach out to him and 
and they'll take your call or whatever you want to do, they'll at least listen to you. Did he then punch you in the face? Cause that's not, cause he seems like that kind of character. No, he, he, yeah, but uh, no, but but he was right in, into that point too. He also made the point that he's like, once you're done playing, he's like, they probably aren't picking up. He's like, you might not get the sit down, you might not get the return call, whatever, but he was like, don't wait until you're 40. He was, I mean, he was playing with me when he was 38 years old, but he's like, don't wait till you're 40 to, to pick up the phone to, um, you know, take advantage of the platform that you have. You know, it's funny, you just said that. One of the things that would be interesting is to think about not only the real estate arbitrage when you're in new markets, but the social graph, right? So like, like it's kind of interesting, like, right? Like who are the five to 25 men and women that you wanna meet when you're in Portland? Like literally when you get to traded to Denver, like is one of the processes, and this is for all the aspiring athletes out there or a- actual athletes, you know, okay, now I'm in Denver. Like literally, who are the 15 to 25 business or cultural leaders of Denver that I wanna meet and you can pull it off? Yeah. It's interesting, okay. How was Duke? Duke was great, man. I, I enjoyed it. I stayed all four years. You yeah. guys don't do that anymore, yeah. but <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed it enough to stay. You're like a unicorn. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> um, but no, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, had a great experience. The fan base is ridiculous, right? Fans are the best. Um, the most. What hated, about when they're the pissed at you? Loved. Yeah, I mean, when they were pissed at you, were they tough, or they kind of like fully bought in and they've won so much, and you guys have such like a winning? I always think that winning organizations yeah. are soft, really. Yeah. You know, like when you're winning often, yeah. like they could only get like when when I get mad at a Jet player, uh. I hate them with all my heart uh. because we haven't won right. ever, and so I'm like, I'm really fucking pissed at you, dude. Like I want to win. Yeah. Whereas like with the Yankees, when I won a bunch, I'm like, yeah, I'm mad at you, but like we've won like so many championships, <laughs> like no big deal, bro. Yeah, well, you know, it, they had had a, a rough stretch before I got to school, and then um, the group I was with my freshman year, we won the championship. So um, it was a good, it was a good. You started off on the right foot. Yeah, and then it was, and then it was like the next three years, you're trying to get back to that, and it, it never happens. So you, you know, you have to enjoy the moment and take it for what it is, because it's not guaranteed to happen again. You go there one time in your freshman year, you're like, oh, this is just what happens. Knowing That's a lot, you know, case. knowing a lot of my f- fan base is a mix. I, I think some of them may not know a lot about you. Tell them a little bit about the family dynamics that I think are really intriguing with you. Yeah, so I have um, two brothers who play in the NBA as well. I have a little brother with the New York Knicks, and then I have an older brother with the Charlotte Hornets. Um, we all had one one year together in high school, one year together in college, but um, those are my best friends. I think I've always benefited from watching my older brother go through the same process that I'm about to embark on, um, and then I've been able to help my little brother too. So it's been a, a great um, dynamic for me. And then also I have a little sister who um, she plays volleyball at Notre Dame, and now I'm just like a cheerleader because I don't know anything about volleyball, but um, I'm happy. Are for your her. parents like? the greatest athletes of all time? <laughs> no, they were athletes. I, they weren't the greatest, but they um, <laughs> they would tell you that too. But um, you know, it, we grew like up- It's in- crazy to think. Yeah. Like forget about even having the DNA, the parenting, mm-hmm. the serendipity, yeah. the great fortune. Yeah. To have three boys in the NBA is so mind bending. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like you see a lot of brothers, a lot of twins, but- yes. Um, three is, we're is, happy when Marshall joined the, the NBA family. Yeah. yeah so. the, the, three, the three thing, how often has that happened? Three brothers one, in one the league? Other time. Which was? I think it was the Berries. Oh, right. In, uh, and their dad played, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so. That's just insane. It doesn't happen that often. Do you guys think like you'll eventually like go on the road like when you're retired and like it'll be all about, like th- there's something really there. Yeah. No, there, yeah, we could definitely do something fun. We, we've always talked about, um, you know, I think the, the best part about it is spending our off season together and working out together. So I have my little brothers here, like I said, with the right. mix, and then my little my older brother likes New York too. So um, we enjoy. You guys are setting up camp here. This yeah, yeah. Plumbly. Who's the best player? Me. Every, but we all say that. So. But what's the true answer? It is right. Yeah. yeah. Like it, like. I would tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah, I believe you. All right, Andy, let's do this. This is your big moment. My big moment. What's the uh, What's the first question? Jason Crocker asks. Dude dropped 40 points on me in high school. How early did you decide to go all in on basketball and commit your life to that pursuit? Well, now I have a new career high in high school. So I don't know I have 40. Um, do you know what your career high in high school is? Of course you do. I really, honestly, I really don't. You're I, that good? Was, Fuck. No, it wasn't that good. <laughs> if, I, it wasn't if my that career high was like 17, I'd be like seven. I, I would to, know everything. I'd be like, yeah, this kid, I crossed him over. No lie, I have to give a shout out to Christ School. I love my high school. It was a, a all boys boarding school in North Carolina. But we had such a good group of guys. Like our whole, our first five all went and played in college. So it was such a fun team to be on. That our whole, our our goal every year is like, can we go undefeated? We really, fit. we never got right. to it. But you, were, you weren't one of those guys that came up in high school where you were the guy dropping sixty four, right? Yeah. So I don't, you know, that's that's funny you ask that. But 
I didn't have 40 in a game, but anyway, uh, my, my, you know, for me, it was a passion early on in Indiana. It's the game. Everybody plays basketball and sure. It's uh, religion. Yeah, it is. It really is like Texas. Are you a Colts fan? I am. Yeah. Colts. Not, not a Pacers fan, but Colts fan. Um, but growing up like, Oh, why not a Pacers fan? You know what? When I was, when I first started watching the NBA, like it was always Utah and Chicago in the finals. So I, I love Chicago. I watch Jordan all the time. So you're a bandwagon Bulls fan? Yeah. I was Northwest Indiana though, so I was close to Chicago. That's how you decided to justify that? And they were winning. I know what they were doing. <laughs> all right, so what did you, so was it from birth you were all in? No, I mean, when I was young and, and just playing at recess on the playground with my brothers. Um, were you always I, ridiculously tall? No, I wasn't always tall. And I think that's the, you know, in the NBA, not the NBA, but in basketball, like you get the guys who are tall, so they're like, well, I'll play basketball, I'll put this to use. But it was always a passion of mine um, from when I was little. and. It's not something that I decided to do because of I, I ended up being tall. So. So when did you go all in? Um, all in, honestly, to me the first the first I would say business move concerning basketball was when I decided to leave my home and go to boarding school. Because up until then, sure. you know, I I loved it. I I would just go and play for the fun of it. And when was like, that? Um, I I did that in my sophomore year of high school. But then you I'm have like, a big freshman year. Uh, I I didn't have a big freshman year. I I played uh, varsity and JV at my hometown high school. Did you grow in that summer like a machine? Uh, no, I was like six, seven, six, eight my freshman year. So it was, I was already taller. <laughs> it just, to me, that was. I like, love the. He's like, no, you know, it's your own reality, right? He just hangs out with seven footers all day. I get it. Yeah. But to me, that was going all in because I didn't. It was basketball was for fun, and that was the first sacrifice made toward the career. So. Cool. Ottawa Hoops asks, how can student athletes use social media to monetize their brand? Ooh. I'll jump in on this one. Yeah, um, so, so I think I think the NCAA is ridif- ridiculously difficult to navigate, and I have real venom towards it. And I don't know every detail. I have real venom towards it because I also grew up in the wine business, where the laws are ridiculous and not practical and are archaic. And then it gets even worse when you really look under the underbelly of why the rules sit there. So I think student athletes have to be careful because they can lose eligibility, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so- were you always scared? Like that, yeah. like it was always yeah. like a bad cloud, right? Yeah. And, and like, Coach K was like, "Don't fuck up." Right? No, you don't. You don't want to mess up his program. He's not gonna like that. But the that's the thing. The the regulations, the rules. You don't. You, you almost. You, you shouldn't be trying to monetize your social yeah. media because they're yeah. gonna hit you over the head but with the suspension. Why, but, so. That's why I have an answer. What your job to do is to really build. If you care about that, if you're that entrepreneurial, and if you're in, you're a javelin, yep. you know, and you're in volleyball. Yep. There's no women's professional volleyball league that's going to pay your sister the kind of money the boys made. Right. So if she's thinking about the entrepreneurial level, what you do while you've got that attention, or if you're the 11th guy at Indiana State and you don't think you're going to the NBA, what I think when you have that attention is you build a fan base. You don't monetize it. You build the platform. The way to do that, whether you're a superstar player or the 11th guy on Indiana State is to engage. Now, if you're a superstar player you're, and you're going to Duke, you're probably worried about your class, you're worried about the program, so you probably have less time. If you're 11th guy at Indiana State, you probably have more time, and so you've gotta just pull levers, but it's about engagement. Again, I, I don't, I, I'm a hot on this because I just, it's a Larry Bird reference and you, I didn't want to use Indiana. Like, I just thought, I thought it was funny. So if you're Indiana State, 11th guy, yeah. right? Every single person that references your game on Twitter is something you can engage with. Maybe you didn't play, but it would be really funny if Tyler was like, you guys suck tonight, and you jump in and are like, yo, bro, they'd be pumped because they actually watched that game, that context building. Now all of a sudden you leave school with 80,000 followers uh, where you would have had maybe 1,500 if you didn't give a crap, and now all of a sudden you are tweeting out looking for opportunities this summer. That's where you're at your height because you just went through the program and six or seven leads come in and away you go. That's really the only way within the rules of the NCAA. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Agreed. Move on. Cool. Uh, Rodney. Rodney. Rodney Pete? His, his handle is DJ. Do you know who Rodney Pete is? Just no. yes or no. Do you know who Rodney Pete is? No. Rodney Pete? No. Rodney Pete? Rodney Pete? Rodney Pete? Rodney Pete? Rodney Pete? Sorry, Rodney. USC right. quarterback, went to the Lions, had a nice career. Um, these youngsters don't Lions, know Rodney. Man, you should know the Lions. He's Come on, Ro- Detroit. We're here. My family's from Michigan. I'm a big Lions. You're a big disappointment, man. <laughs> Let's move on. Rodney asks, what did the NBA teach you about basketball that you can apply to marketing or branding on social media? 
So the first thing they do is they sit you down and show you what you can get fined for. <laughs> but surprisingly, a lot of the stuff is I was watching what guys got in trouble for. All that stuff. Uh, created such buzz and got them a lot of followers. So it's kind of like, hey, <laughs> You're like, like the arbitrage was worth it. Yeah. And on and get a yeah. Lot of, but anyway, yeah. to me, the the best advice that they gave us was um, be yourself. Don't make every post about a, pro, a product pitch or you know you, right away. So you get um, as soon as you come out of the league, or as soon as you as soon as you finish um, university, then you can accept money for like then you can Sneakers. start mon monetizing, right? So. Um, right away, you're gonna have people, hey, tweet this, pitch my product, whatever, I'll pay you. Sports that cards. Yes, yeah, it's, it's good and well, but you don't want your um, social media to be flooded with that. Um, you just wanna be genuine, be who you are. Um, I think it, it's also good to share, you know, don't just reply to, to tweets and whatever after wins. You know, be the same person, wins and losses, don't go into a hole, um, you know, depending on the situation. So, be I careful who you're genuine, responding to be and authentic. how. Yeah, be um, always. You know, respond to real people. I think there are a lot of a lot of people hiding behind different accounts out sure. there, um, stuff like that. Yeah, dunk. So, uh, yes. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Tell me, talk to me about, talk to me about the biggest thing you learned. Yeah. In your first season, in the NBA, nothing to do with marketing, just yeah. macro learning. You know, this has probably been on your mind. Right. You know, as a little kid, then definitely got more serious after your freshman year of high school. Yeah. Here it is. This is it. You're in the league. Yeah. What's the biggest thing you learned in year one? Kevin obviously sat down and yeah. gave you some good advice. You had some good bets on that yeah. team that you stumbled into. Great bets. But like yeah. what, like macro, like. To me, the, the biggest thing I took away is um, there's so much, like I came from a college where there was stability. Coach K was my coach every year. Um, I have, for the most part, similar teammates every year. The NBA and, you know, I talked to my friends with other jobs. Um, there's so much turnover. There's so much um, unpredictability like I went into work I went into practice one morning and they said hey Jim wants to talk to you hey you're going to Denver okay cool so <laughs> you're, you you can't control your situation you can you know you I'm can do that to D-Rock tomorrow I'm like you know what <laughs> you've been traded to the Chattanooga office <laughs> but it's crazy yeah. right like you no. have to pick up your whole life yeah like there's so a lot of great things that comes along with professional sports and I'm yeah. sure the veterans tell you once your family kicks in right right your no, daughter no. loves her school in Denver and now you're in Sacramento. Yeah, so I, I think the, the best piece of advice that I got from those guys and I watched it happen on that first team is, you know, no matter what's happening around the game, have the same work habits, have the same approach to practice, to the games, to shoot around, to film session. Have an approach that you believe in, that you can stick to, and it's not gonna change regardless of what. And have you done that? Absolutely, yeah, I have. I mean, I'm only four years in, but I- But I you're on three like teams in four years. Three teams in four years, uh, four different head coaches, so. I, I feel like I have found a routine and something that I believe in that I can continue to grow and get better regardless of the situation. Was it easier to walk into the Denver locker room after experience being the new guy in the Portland locker room? Yeah, for sure. Was Absolutely. that weird and scary? Um, I mean, everything everything's, I would say, unpredictable. You don't yeah. know what to expect. Yeah. Um, I was telling, well, actually, funny, when I went into the Denver locker room, they started playing a rap song, so now, I did a rap song, so everywhere yeah. I go, people make fun of me for it, which is, it's fine. I have, I have fun with it, so, um, you know, that, that lightened the mood, but anyway, That's like, cool. and also the NBA, you know, you know players on every team, so right. it, You went to, yeah. you, in high school, and college, things of that nature. Right. Right, so. cool. Andy K. Cody Wheat asks, what do you think people get wrong about professional athletes? What do you think is the biggest misconception? I can tell you the thing that bothers me the most is when people talk about uh, athletes are stupid or dumb or whatever and they go broke because they don't know what they're doing. I've seen, I don't know anybody, all the players that I know are still in the league, but they don't, people have gone broke or they've lost, you know, what they've made out of, I've seen more, I could see it happening more from generosity That's exactly from right. bad business moves. It's not. I'm so glad you said this. I apologize to cutting you off. I am stunned by that variable as we've just recruited our first class, you're exactly yeah. right. It's not that they're dumb, it's they, that they do their so inner circle, and, and, and listen, there's a lot of cliche, lower middle class, poor, you know, and, and it's like they wanna help, they've been, they've been praying to get through the system to this moment. You know, being rich, you can get injured. You know, coming from tough places, you could get into trouble, like, I think that's exactly right, my yeah. man. They're, they're trying to do good, so much so. I don't know if you've seen this, I've already seen this. Some of these kids have to go through the very difficult decision of actually cutting off their world because literally all that's happening is there's, I've, I saw a kid with his cell phone and in 30 minutes 
get asked for tens of thousands of dollars from 11 different people. Right. And it, it happens all the time. And, and it's not it's out. It's a really it, good it's one. I'm glad you went there, man. People are so quick to say, bad, you know, bad business move, bad restaurant, bad this, bad that. It, I've seen more, I, the most generous people I've ever met have been teammates in the NBA, at, without a doubt. Now, there's also Antoine Walker who's out of his mind. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I, I, know Antoine, I know, I love, and by the way, on that note, I'm making that joke because I want to give him a compliment. What he's doing right now for kids and like that are coming out of the league, yeah. and you know, it takes a lot of humility. And listen, I'm sure there's economics with it. I don't know him, but right, right. you know, I'm sure he's getting paid and isn't hurting to get, you know, doesn't hurt to get the money. But he's going in there saying, "Look at me. This is right. the like, look what happened. Man made hundreds of millions of dollars." Yeah. Oof, Andy K. <laughs> Andy felt that one. Sam asks. How are you able to stay positive when working towards your goals and ambitions without seeing improvement on a regular basis? That, to me, that's one of the hardest things. Um, you know, I think whether you do What part of your game was toughest for you? If you said, yeah. at a macro, the thing right. that was hardest for you to develop in your game yeah. that you can rewind to now, like we're going very macro basketball right, right now, what, what would that be? Well, I could say, like, so last, um, last summer I wanted to change the, the way in which I shot the ball, my form. And Period? Period, yeah. Well, that's so, like, it's, a little crazy. Yeah, and I, well, it's, it's, it's crazy it's if you have something, I always felt like this. Tiger Woods broke down a swing that had won Masters, <laughs> and, right. and then he reworked it. Right. I wasn't breaking down a shot that <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was breaking down a shot that didn't work. So I, I love like, it. I wanted to change my form, and so it's and? Me, it was, you know, it was very, there were a lot of times I didn't see progress. I didn't, you know, I got with the coach and we were in the gym every day and, and it was frustrating. Stuff felt awkward. It didn't, uh, you, have, you have muscle memory and habits that are hard to break if you've been doing them wrong for so long. So um, that was something that, that I, you know, I just fully committed to last summer. And, and? Uh, there were, like, he, like the question said, there were a lot of times where you-, you But where are we right now? Things. You know, I felt, I feel very good. I'm still- to In me, it? I'm still in it. I'm still on that journey. I'm very happy with where my form is. Um, you know, I hit more jump shots this year than I have any year in the league. And that's, now I feel like I have a base and a form that I can build, build on, on top. and continue to improve. Andy, so. you should, you know, your jump <laughs> shot has been, been struggling lately. <laughs> where are you right now with your game? I haven't been playing that much. Me neither. Dunk? How are you feeling about yourself? You're very I athletic. Feel, I always feel good about yeah, the Yeah, but game, blindly. But yeah. How's the actuality of it? Good. You playing well? All right. So, Jake? I just haven't played in a while. You, Jake, how you doing? No, no basketball. No basketball. <laughs> I mean, if we go up against me. Sure. Yeah, Probably. listen, I'll give you a preview. You're going to lose. <laughs> what makes you guys talking about Yoda? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it, Tell me. Like I said, it was a, I found a, a shooting coach. He's... Yoda's the name of a dude who's Tell a him shooting him coach. Yoda, uh, oh, because you had to do all sorts of weird stuff, like close your eyes and like shoot backwards, like no, no, while no, you're no, elevated no, no, eating it's Jello. Just, like, it's just more. He's like a bald little. Great, you know how you get the gray hair going around here. Yeah. He made how? What's the, he has the record for oh, most? Yeah. So he doesn't. He didn't have like. There are shooting coaches in the NBA. Of course. This guy had no NBA. Clients. Right. He's an unofficial kind of he's Yoda. Like an old white little Steph Curry. Yeah. But I watched him, and the guy he made like. I think 1,503 free throws in a row. So I was like, hey, I want to work you with saw you. That, you saw that on YouTube or you so were like sitting there tying your shoes and watched an old white dude hit 1,503 free throws? <laughs> Just curious. He, drills it, he had the film of it. Got it, got I, it. He, he on, his, on the spot, if you walk in the gym, he'll rip you off 100 in a row. And I was like, that's, that's, <laughs> so inc that's incredible. Awesome. And uh, we call him Yoda because he's little and bald and wise. What? And like, yeah, you know, yeah. So. yeah. I love it. Good dude. <laughs> Mace, I'm glad you stopped by, man. Thanks for having me. You get to ask the question of the day. You get to ask any question you want, macro, micro, basketball, life, entrepreneurship, interests, yeah. anything you want. Uh, you'll get thousands of answers. It might be some good insight. Um, okay. Fire away. Anything. Anything. Um, man. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's the best thing to do in New York over the summer that people don't know about? And don't tell me Hamilton because you can't get tickets to that. What's Why can't you get tickets? Cause they pay well in the NBA. They do, but so it's, buy some fucking tickets, right, Mason. I'll, I'll buy some tickets. Okay, good. What's the what's the thing to do in New York in the summer that that people don't know about that you just have to do? How about that? Love it, my uh, man. Cool. Thanks, Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, you keep asking questions. We'll keep answering them.